So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Friday seminar. Today, we're very happy to have Martin Kunz from the University of Geneva. So um, Martin uh, studied um, theoretical physics over at the ETH, um, then went to, uh, on to do his PhD with Ruth Dura, who some of you also know, uh, uh, at the University of Geneva. For his postdocs, he went to the UK, first to Oxford, and then to uh, the University of Sussex. Then came back to Geneva as uh, Professor Bossier, uh, with the SNF, right? Um, after that, uh, went back to Sussex as a lecturer and um, now returned uh, to the University of Geneva first as a senior scientist and now as an associate professor. He has been uh, active in Planck, in the core team, uh, is uh, in, active in the Hyrex uh, collaboration and in Euclid. Uh, as you maybe know, he's also uh, been elected as the incoming uh, uh, Euclid representative of Switzerland. Um, I know Martin, since uh, I did my first postdoc in Geneva, uh, we have done a lot of exciting projects together. So I'm really happy uh, that he's here today. He's going to talk about uh, lensing and last year structure observations. Um, so yeah, happy to have you uh, take it away. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a, a very nice and hospitable place. Um, so uh, when, I, when I was thinking what I should talk about, uh, one possibility would have been to talk about uh, the work with Julian, uh, but uh, I'm actually, since Julian is here, he can uh, explain, you, explain you things. So you will see maybe a few times G evolution. So he, I hope Julian has told you a lot about it. Such a great thing. Otherwise, you should force him to. Uh, so instead, I will talk. I will be talking more about lensing, and uh, especially uh, lensing of large-scale structure, which is something uh, I've been working a bit on. But actually, uh, Julian is also uh, involved, and uh, one of the key people is, is uh, Francesca, who's sitting there. So uh, actually, for some of the things I will talk about, she's the real expert. And so uh, if, you, if your questions become too difficult, and uh, I'll just uh, deflect them. And uh, so, so, so both were in Geneva, and uh, then uh, there is a whole crowd also in Geneva. So Ruth and Kami, um, students and ex-students of me, postdoc of, uh, of Kami, ex-postdocs, uh, new SNF professors, ex-students, and so on. Uh, so that was so that's some work we did over over some time, but uh, and actually I should say that I'm usually very busy. So these are the people who actually do the work. Um, so I I didn't put uh, an outline. So what I will discuss a bit, you can kind of see here. This is a slide that was made by uh, ESA for the Planck mission, and it shows that this is these are the light rays from the CMB, and as they traverse the forming large large scale structure. They are being deflected by gravitational lensing. And so by the time we observe them here, don't ask me exactly how this is supposed to work, uh, they, will be, they will be in a different place and coming from a different direction. And uh, this was a bit, well, it will not, it will, uh, so, so this was actually something that wasn't even really considered for Planck originally when the original science case was written. It was something that became that. But it became obvious, became obvious that this was useful actually later. And so today, this is really a CMB lensing. It's an important uh, part of CMB science. But of course, it's not only the photons from the CMB, but actually any photons that go through the large scale structure or any particle or any other wave, also gravitational waves, all of them get, uh, get lensed gravitationally. And so any observations that we do to uh, to, to a non-negligible redshift will carry this signature. And so <clears throat> what I want to do today is first kind of illustrate it a bit with CMB and other examples, and then ask the question, well, is it actually relevant, for example, for the large scale structure? And um, well, you can think if the answer is going to be yes, otherwise I might have chosen another topic. And, uh, and then, okay, is it relevant? Is it also useful? And uh, so I will try to argue also yes, and how can we use it? Okay, so that's a bit the topic. So I think it's a fairly, I was told uh, the, the audience uh, covers a large part of science. So I've tried to make it 
uh, relevant. So, but uh, of course, I will have forgotten a few things. So please do not hesitate to ask questions at any time, at any level. Okay, so it's okay to say I have no clue what's on this slide. It's also okay to say I think you forgot the factor two pi. Uh, <laughs> okay, and I think now I need to restart this thing first by hand. Okay, so here. Here, that's so the first illustration of Lensing. So here is the CMB power spectrum from the Planck 2018 release, okay? And as I said, this will carry a signature of Lensing, and this is completely unavoidable because the only thing we observe is the CMB here. We cannot go back and observe the original CMB. So necessarily, we will have a Lensing signature in our data. And uh, so, uh, here I plotted the, the actual, what we expect is the right curve. So the, the, the blue one, which is the one that uh, contains the lensing and the yellow dashed one, I turned off the lensing, okay? And so you can clearly see the huge difference between the two curves. Yeah. And so it's, it's natural to wonder, is this relevant at all? <laughs> and uh, however, you also have to see the, the, in, the the incredibly small error bars on this measurement. So, so here is the difference um, so between, so basically the, the blue curve, which is the theory curve was subtracted. And so you see, you see, you see the residuals. And just to be clear, you should use the left hand, the right hand scale uh, from here on. So here in this region around 1,500 or so, the error bars, okay, it's been in redshift a bit, but the error bars are of the order of 10 micro Kelvin squared or so. Not that I didn't look it up, so just my visual guess. Okay, so now we can look at the residuals you would get if you forgot to use lensing. Okay, so that's the difference between the two curves. And compared to the thousands of micro Kelvin squared, it's a tiny difference, as you saw. But in nonetheless, around here, it's still 20, 30 micro Kelvin squared. And like 30 micro Kelvin squared is much bigger than these error bars. So even though it looks like a tiny signal, our measurements are now so precise that it's actually huge compared to our uncertainties. And uh, so very early, when, when, we, when we got one of the first internal likelihood deliveries, I thought, okay, I'll run some Lambda CDM analysis in Planck. And, uh, and I asked, I can't remember Camber class to give me CLs and I turned on the lensing and I got CLs. And uh, so I, 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 I didn't have time unfortunately to redo it. And I got the curve, I got posteriors that were way off from where I expected them to be. And so for a while I was wondering whether Planck had huge systematic errors or whether I, uh, or, or, or whether I should call up the Nobel Prize Committee. But then luckily, before I, I did either, I, I realized that the CLs that I got actually were the unlensed CLs because the lensed CLs are called lensed CLs. Okay, I don't ask me why anyone would do that. And, uh, and the shift was exactly because I had forgotten to, to include the lensing. So it's really a huge, it's a huge shift. So if you forget to, in, to use the lensing in, C, in the CMB, you're way off. And not surprisingly, the CMB community knows that and is, of course, using the lens CLs. And so, so if you forget to use it, you get a huge bias. But on the other hand, the lensing signal also helps you. So in the CMB, in the CMB data, uh, one prominent feature is this peak, which gives you uh, um, uh, an angular diameter distance to the last scattering surface. And that, that very precisely measures uh, a distance that cuts out in this diagram, which is curvature versus matter density in the universe, cuts out what we call the geometric degeneracy. And just the CMB alone really measures for these parameters mostly this degeneracy, and it would be very long and you can nearly not say anything. But the gravitational lensing that is unavoidable, pre unavoid un unavoidably present in your spectrum depends on how much matter there is because the matter. The more matter there is, the more gravitational lensing you get. And so, so the fact that you actually, just from the spectrum, you get curves here is actually because of the lensing. So the lensing here helps you constrain the, uh, your parameter space significantly. So, so it is, on the one hand, you shouldn't forget the lensing because it biases you if you, if you 
if you don't include it on the other hand, it also helps you. So why shouldn't you use it, right? And, uh, and then you can actually do better, but that I will get to at the very end, depending how slowly I'm talking or not. Okay, so let me, uh, as, a, as now, as a little introduction, let me go a bit through the lensing formalism so that we all can do a bit of GR, uh, probably because I teach GR at the moment. <laughs> so it's a bit a deformation professionnelle, okay? So, so when, we, when we look at the just weakly perturbed universe, so nearly Newtonian, then the metric uh, is, is diagonal and it, it has, a, so it's the Minkowski metric here because I work in flat space, flat space minus one, 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 and it has perturbations that are the Newtonian gravitational potential effectively. So the solution of the Poisson equation, okay? And the photons follow some trajectory that we will split into a background trajectory and the deviation. The background trajectory here is just a straight line. We are in Minkowski space, okay? And so here is the wave vector, which is the first derivative and the corresponding for the, for the deviation. And then we write down the geodesic equation, and then we take the metric, we calculate the Christoffel symbols. Okay, the Christoffel symbols are derivatives of the metric, so you can go back to your GR book. Uh, but it's all kind of fairly mechanical. And, uh, and so since these are derivatives of the metric, well, the derivative of one, uh, even I know it's zero. So the, the only the thing you get are derivatives of the phi, and you find that the, the temporal part is the, is the projection of the derivative along the wave vector here, because we linearize it, it's along the background wave vector. And the, the vector part is the full gradient minus the longitudinal the projection, so it's the transverse, okay? And that's the deflection angle is by how much the deviation changes. So as you propagate, your deflection turns, and how much it turns, that tells you by how much your, your uh, light ray was deflected. Okay, so this is this delta L, and this delta L is the integral of DL over uh, the, the, the affine parameter integrated. So this gives you the total DL, but this here is just that. And so, so what you do, you integrate this perpendicular derivative of pi. Okay, and so that is what will tell you how much you, you, you get lensed. And then, uh, even though I'm not going to use it, but if you do the same in the, for the temporal part, then you get a time delay called the Shapiro time delay. Okay. It's all very easy, I hope. Probably everybody, everybody knows this already, <laughs> but uh, just since we are theorists, we can do a little warm up. Okay, and then if you, if you do the same in the cosmological context, you have to work a bit harder. And uh, so I guess the first person more or less was Chayu who do, did, did this. And then Rutur and Kami Bova and uh, Anthony Chalinor and Anthony Lewis, okay? And, uh, and so if you look at the source, well, you, have, you can write it in linear perturbation theory at, being at the unperturbed position plus the gravitational lensing that we just had. So I think the battery is running out. Uh, <laughs> I'll just keep pointing in some, some other way. Actually, a stick might be useful if there is one, but don't worry. Uh, so there is the gravitational lensing and the Shapiro time delay. And now that we are in a cosmological setting, we also have a redshift. We also have redshift, so we get the redshift perturbation. But okay, what I'm mostly concerned with uh, will be that part. Okay, um, but what, okay, so this is, this is kind of the, the way sources get deflected. Now a slight complication is what we really want to know is, for example, do sources get brighter? Do they get deformed? Okay, and, and that is actually, in order for the source to get brighter or deformed, you need to look at nearby rays and you need to, so, uh, and how, they, how their, their position changes. And so that's the change of this position. And so that adds another derivative, okay? And so, so what you really want to know is what we call this, I would, I would call a deformation matrix, it's called amplification matrix. So how a little, let's say, circular light bundle is deformed. And so there is very, this is actually very generic, such a deformation you can write as a, as a surface change, which is the trace part, that's the kappa, the magnification, and the shear, or like a, a, a volume preserving, um, deformation, which is the gamma, 
and then uh, a rotation that is uh, that is uh, irrelevant and usually unobservable. Okay, this kind of small print applies, so let's not get into such questions. Um, but what, what I'm really interested here is the, sorry, this one, the kappa, the magnification part, as we will see. So the way resources get brighter or less bright. And um, so as I said, that depends on the derivative of the deflection. And so the deflection was integral of the, of the, of the perpendicular gradient of, of the gravitational potential. And so there is another derivative. So now it's the second derivative of this integral because we can take the derivatives in and out and that's the way it's usually written. So it's actually this one. So this, this little hat here means perpendicular derivative on the sphere in this case. Okay. So, and so this is the quantity that we want. And as I hope I made kind of, I, I managed to motivate. Um, it is the, this, this second derivative of, of an integral over the gravitational potential. Now in general, in GR, we don't have one gravitational potential. We have two gravitational potentials if we are no longer in a nearly Newtonian situation necessarily. Okay. And so, so to give you another little illustration of this effect before I go to the actual topic that I want to talk about, but just to, to, to make the point that really everything gets lensed. So we, we saw the CMB. So another thing that gets lensed and where, where it's often neglected so far is uh, supernovae, for example. So supernovae also get lensed. And so here, here we actually looked at the impact, basically at the change on the luminosity distance of everything that happened. So my personal interest was actually less the lensing, it was what is called back reaction, but that's something we can discuss later, okay? So my takeaway point here, usually I show this slide to argue that back reaction is not significant, but what you certainly can see is what, what you see here is, the, is the, the luminosity distance to 11 million halos in a very large evolution simulation. And you can see that there is a fairly big scatter. And this scatter is mostly due to the gravitational lensing of the supernovae. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and so there are two things that, that are here important. One of them is, okay, how much does this scatter affect the average? Because then when you analyze supernova data, you, you, you write down a likelihood. And so you want to know the average expansion rate. Does it agree with the, the idea that it is the background expansion rate? And you can see that in the average, the scatter is much smaller than the, uh, than the scatter in the, in the supernovae themselves. Incidentally, this is an irreducible noise pretty much. Okay, So even these are, these are perfect standard candle. And the second thing it does is that when you cut through, this is not actually a Gaussian probability distribution, but it is skewed. Okay, most supernovas get demagnified and the few get strongly magnified and on average, it, it nearly goes away. And so then you can say, okay, let's just analyze this naively. And if you analyze this naively, okay, so this is again matter, okay, matter and curvature, and this is the input model. Well, if you analyze it naively, you're actually quite far away. But I should say that, okay, this is maybe not too concerning right now because this is some kind of super data set. It's, it's stronger even than uh, what LSST, um, what's it called these days? Vera Rubin. That's exactly Rubin. is going to deliver it to us. Thank you. Um, and so, but you can see that you're actually quite far off. But the, this, this deviation is, is, is mostly due, due to the fact that, that we used here a Gaussian likelihood instead of the correct description. And this you can get rid of by binning supernovae, central limit theorem takes this away. And then you see that you are still slightly shifted. And then, then you can see that this is the quantity you usually use, the, uh, the distance modulus, the logarithm of the, of the distance. Okay, if you were to use one over the distance squared, then you actually are in nice agreement because in that case, um, you actually effectively look at intensity rather than distance. And if you look at intensity there, because of photon conservation, lensing is absent in first order. So lensing kind of averages out because everything compensates because of photon conservation. Okay, so that's actually something that I will use later as well. Sorry, but so the, the point here is, okay, uh, uh, lensing is important, and what you do can also be important. <laughs> okay, but 
but but what I really and, and really everything gets lens, including the standard candles. Okay, so but what I really wanted to talk about was the impact on galaxy catalogs. So galaxy catalogs we usually call number counts because we just count the number of galaxies in certain directions. Okay, you could think why should counting galaxies be affected? Okay. <laughs> But it actually is also, so I should have put the same people here, Chayu, Ruth, Dominic, Anthony, and Anthony, uh, because they, they calculated really this. And, and so apart from other things, okay, this is the actual density. There is, there are two things that happen. And one of them is that lensing changes your, your angle, so your volume, if you want. And so when you count galaxies, if your volume changes, your galaxy density changes. And so this is this minus two here. And the other thing is that it also makes supernova, uh, make, that it makes galaxies brighter or less bright. And in a catalog, you have some minimal luminosity that you can observe. And if a, if a supernova is lensed, it can just come in or it can drop out. Okay, and that depends on the slope of the luminosity function and that effect is there. And so, so magnification therefore changes the number counts by this factor where there are these somewhat competing contributions. Okay, so number counts are very much affected. Okay, that we already said. And as I said, now for, for intensity measurements, effectively this S is uh, uh, 0.4, and so this factor exactly cancels. You have second order effects, but not nothing at first order. And just because I, in case it's not, uh, in case, um, well, I'm, I'm sure you often get cosmology seminars. So, so this here is the actual number count as a function of redshift and direction, but we usually, characterize everything statistically. So we use uh, uh, spherical harmonics. So we use uh, angular power spectra, so the two-point function on the sphere. So, so if you see CLs, then that means we look at the, the power spectrum. And L gives you like, it's like K. So higher L is smaller scales, lower L is larger scales. Actually, that was what, the, what was already in the CMB plot before. Okay, so, so is this important? So here is, a bit, here is a result from an earlier paper where we looked at this. And uh, so there we tried to have something a bit like Euclid, but that was five years ago. And you can see that uh, so the, the, the red analysis is the correct analysis where we take lensing into account. The blue one is, uh, is the one when we pretend there is no lensing. And you can see that there tends in, in many parameters, there is a significant shift. And if you look at the goodness of fit, you get the delta chi square of 2000. So if you don't take lensing into account, your fit is really bad in this case. So that corresponds to nominally some 45 sigma of signal in your, in your data set for the presence of lensing. Okay. And then you can say, well, but I actually only look at autocorrelations and why I say that we will see in a moment. But that doesn't help you either. It actually gets even worse, okay? <laughs> okay. And so at that point, we would say, well, probably it's really important, but, but uh, that somehow didn't really convince, uh, I mean, it was not convincing enough to kind of convince everybody that lensing should be taken into account. And, uh, and so, so, so recently, uh, Euclid has been doing, uh, a series of forecasts. And so one of the questions there was, okay, for the, the, the current, our understanding of what Euclid will do, so how in a, in a more sophisticated analysis, how important is the impact? And actually this study was led by, uh, by Francesca. And so that's where you, where you can direct questions to her. But uh, in case you haven't heard of Euclid, so Euclid is a, is a, is a space telescope that will uh, observe in the optical and near infrared. And it's actually not so far away anymore. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's a bit delayed, but in a bit more than a year, Euclid will actually be launched. So I've been working on Euclid since about 2006, and it has been a long way, but slowly we're actually catching up with launch. Actually, with Planck, it was the same. So with Planck, for a while, the launch date was moving to the future exactly the way time passed, so it never came closer. But <laughs> with Euclid, luckily, we were never quite in that limit, but uh, now we, we will soon catch up. But it's also nice because then it means that within, within a few years, we will, uh, we, we hope to have actual Euclid data. 
and Euclid will do a large galaxy survey. Actually, Euclid will do more or less this. It takes photos, so Euclid will deliver uh, more or less Hubble Space Telescope quality images over 15,000 square degrees. So that's a, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very exciting data set, not only for cosmologists, but uh, for generally for astronomers. Um, it does a near infrared photometry to, to determine what we call photometric redshift, so approximate redshift, and it does spectroscopy. But so you can see that the, the total number of sources are of the order of 10 billion, of which about 1 billion is sufficiently well resolved to be able to measure shapes. Uh, but the spectra are only measured for some 30 million galaxies. Okay, so taking spectra is expensive. Okay, and so all of that will be put together to, to measure what we call uh, cosmic shear. So we measure the gravitational lensing through the deformation of sources. This is the gamma that we saw earlier, and it will measure the distribution of galaxies. And so these are the two things that, that we plan to use. And incidentally, also, as you find, most of you will probably know Euclid because uh, here is also the place with the biggest simulations, numerical simulations for Euclid that, uh, that really help. That, really, that, are, that are essential because in order to, to be able to correctly analyze such a data set, uh, the only way you can, be, you can get a handle on systematic effects is by, by having very precise simulation. Okay, so I have a few slides on forecasting, but maybe I will go fairly quickly through them because I don't really want to teach Fisher forecasts. But uh, so just to say, uh, the, in the Fisher matrix formalism, you have the log likelihood and you look at the peak and you look at the curvature at the peak. Okay, and so if it's more curved, then you have a smaller error bar. And uh, just because in case you haven't, you haven't seen a Gaussian, okay, here is a Gaussian. <laughs> um, and except we actually have a, a covariance matrix. We have, a, we have a vector and a covariance matrix. Okay, and so if you take the logarithm of this and you take derivatives, well, there are two things that can depend on the parameters. That's the mean, okay, uh, here, the mean, or the error, which here is the covariance matrix. And so you get the derivative term in the error and the derivative term in the mean. And it turns out that if you, so, uh, if you use the, the spectra as your data, so as the mean, it's, better, it's a better approximation to drop this term and only use that term and that we can maybe discuss. I mean, it is because it's really the, it's the random fluctuations that are Gaussian-ish. Um, and so the, the, the spec, the two-point function is, is not Gaussian. And so if you use the Gaussian likelihood, you make a mistake and you make actually less of a mistake if you drop that, okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and so then the Fisher matrix is this term where you, that the mu is now the spectra and here is the covariance of the spectra. And the Gaussian part of the covariance is because this is a four point function in your Gaussian variable. And so you use Wick's theorem to, to split it into products of two point functions. Okay, and then there is in principle some more terms that we currently don't really use. Okay, then you have to write this as a very strictly just skip. I shouldn't really have put it here. Okay, this is how you calculate your spectra. Okay, and then we get to the, to what we, what we think now, how important this will be for Euclid. And so that's, uh, that's exactly where uh, Francesca is the, actually the lead uh, scientist on that project. <clears throat> okay, and so, so maybe an interesting question is how many galaxies do we have as a function of redshift? So this, this was updated from, from simulations. So actually exactly from the simulations that are also from here. Um, and here, that's the measurement of this slope of the luminosity function that tells us, you know, you remember it's the, the impact of lensing is 5s minus 2. And so if the s is uh, 0.4, then the, the lensing magnification is very small. And you can actually also see that it will change sign, okay, as you change redshift. And so you see that at low redshift, it's big, then it's smallish, and then it gets big again. Okay. And so then you stick all of that into your forecast code, you crank the handle, and then you can extract some, uh, some interesting results. And so here is, for example, uh, these are plots that I really like. Um, this shows how much signal there is uh, as a function of 
So, the, so we have the two point function of your observables at two redshifts, okay? And so as a function of the, the redshifts in the redshift pins, this is where the signal is for the density, for the, the cosmic shear V cleansing measurements and for the correlation of density and magnification Archie cosmic shear in this case, okay? And so firstly, you can see that there is actually huge signal. It's 400 sigma effective signal in these pins, okay? And you can see that the density, the signal is, is, on, the, is on the diagonal. So, so if, you, if you correlate density and density, um, the, this correlation decays very rapidly as you move apart uh, because there is not much connection between the number of galaxies at high redshift and the number of galaxies at low redshift. They just evolve differently. But if you, if you, if you are at the same redshift, this is the dominant contribution because the density is the biggest contribution. Okay. And then, oops, back. And the cosmic shear, on the other hand, is off diagonal uh, because there you compare the, uh, but it's still, it's still close to the diagonal. So there you, you compare the, the, the lensing together with the lensing. And I mean, that's typically an intermediate redshift because that's. Uh, that's where the, yeah, you have the most galaxies and the lensing is strong. Actually, maybe I start to say silly things. You can correct me, uh, Francesca. Okay, and this is the, the cross signal is dominated by uh, uh, the, the clustering at low redshifts. And so here, and the shear at intermediate redshifts, okay, because um, the shear is this integrated quantity, right? It's this, it's this lensing. If lensing is integrated. And so it's, it's the biggest somewhere in the middle with the deflection, if you think of it, right? If you, if you look at just close to, to where you have a source, there is very little deflection. So it's somewhere in the middle. And that's why uh, you have the, the point where the shear is strong, and then you have to go to low redshifts for the density. Okay. And, and you can see that the signal is, is, is about comparable. So this is... This lensing is cosmic shear. This is not the magnification. Okay, this is a, this, this is a different observable. So here we, we, we neglected the magnification part. And so how much signal is in the magnification part? So we see it's lower. It's only of the order of 100 sigma, but that's still a, a very big signal. Okay. And uh, you can also see that the magnification is very much dominated by the off diagonal, exactly for the same reason as the shear. Because you have you need a, you need sources at the background that are being lensed, but their back there their lensing is big halfway to the observer, and so you need the comparison sources uh, halfway to this. The, it's the density between us and these background sources that does the lensing, okay? And so the lensing is correlated with the density, and so the density density then is somewhere in the middle. So that's why you have these these off diagonal, okay? And so it's it's, uh, and it's similar, uh, it's similar with the, the, the shear magnification. Um, actually, I have a, I at some point after I have a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that only, that only realized when I was putting the plots together. Okay, so, so how important is it? So we saw there is a non-negligible signal. It's smaller than the main observables, but it's non-negligible. So, so here is the, is the change in the uncertainty, if you use just the galaxy catalog without magnification or the galaxy catalog with magnification, either knowing exactly the magnification or having some uncertainty. And you can see that the error bars decrease, and this is a logarithmic scale. Okay, so this is a factor two. And uh, so you have, you sometimes have uh, parameter uncertainties decreasing by up to a factor two. Now this is this looks small on the plot, but it's actually huge because when you a factor two in uncertainty is like a factor four in survey volume, okay? And so when you build when you build a, a, a one billion euro satellite, gaining factors of two for three is a, is a big deal. But then uh, what you can't really see here, but so uh, um, these but. Uh, uh, I can just tell you, when you combine all the probes, so you combine the cosmic shear and the galaxy clustering and their cross correlation, then your error bars become also significantly slower because there is even more signal in that. And then the, 
the, the lensing magnification doesn't help you a lot anymore. So when you only look at the galaxy clustering, then your magnification is really useful. If you combine the main Euclid probes, then the magnification doesn't add a lot anymore. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> however, I should also say finally, well, uh, we will see it in a moment. That also depends on the model that we look at. Okay. So, uh, so this is for the information, but the, the bigger worry really is the bias. Okay. And so here you have the, the bias in different parameters. So that's just how you calculate the bias in the Fisher matrix formalism. Um, but let me not go through that. Uh, uh, so here is the bias either for the photometric clustering or for the probe combination. So, so you remember the probe combination didn't profit a lot from magnification. So maybe you would think maybe magnification is not important in the probe combination case. But actually, see for the, for the bias, it's actually just the opposite. Okay, you have huge biases in terms of uncertainty. Okay, these these bars go to four sigma more in bias. I should say that because here we use Fisher matrix. At that point, the result is no longer reliable, but it certainly tells you it's big. Okay, and I mean even even like. Even one sigma biases are bad. Actually, in many ways, one sigma biases are maybe worse than four sigma biases. You no, know, because when I did my Planck mistake, there I had like four or five sigma biases, and that you see, okay, <laughs> if you are way off, you realize that you that you have a problem. If you're just slightly shifted, it may take a long time to realize that you have a problem. So maybe it's better if you have a big bias because then you know. But still, the message is. Definitely, in such an analysis, you must take magnification into account. So there is no, for like for, for the Euclid analysis, there is simply no choice. It has to be consistently taken into account. And that, will need, that means that uh, the, the, the analysis really needs to, needs to be done in a way to be able to do that. Okay, good. So, so then, then the question is maybe, so now we saw it's there, uh, maybe can we actually extract it? Okay, because it's all mixed up, right? We just measured the total spectrum. So are there ways to extract it? And so, yes, there are ways, and I will tell you why in a moment, this is maybe interesting. Uh, so the standard way is that uh, <clears throat> you look at where your signal is, okay? This is the density density signal. This is the magnification signal in the density. And you see that they are not in the same place. Right? The density is on the diagonal. The, the magnification is, is very much off diagonal because you see the correlation between the background sources and that are being lensed in the middle and the density in the middle okay, or at low energy. And so, so that means if you don't want that part, well, you just have to look here. Okay? And so this is the standard approach where you just look at very off diagonal terms. And so we were thinking a bit whether one couldn't do this better. And so, so, so we remembered that uh, if you have an intensity measurement, you don't actually have lensing. And so if you have your galaxy clustering that has magnification, so I use magnification and lensing a bit interchangeably, and, and you have an intensity measurement that doesn't have lensing, you can use the intensity measurement to subtract your, your density contribution. So that's a kind of a reference signal. And so that was what we called it Jimco. So that's the idea that you, you have, you combine an intensity measurement and your galaxy measurement, and then you swap it around. Okay. And then, then you, because if we have the galaxy in the background and the intensity, that's only density in the foreground, then we, we have the density density, but we also have the lensing the magnification here correlated with that. But when we swap around, we have the density density, but we don't have the magnification because the intensity measurement doesn't have magnification, okay? And so that means you nicely subtract the density density. And so here you can see it in action. So that's for, a, for not very widely separated bins. That's the, con that's the contamination as a density contribution in the first case, and that's the density contribution for this, uh, this combined estimate. And so it's a very nice decrease, okay? And uh, so it's not perfect because there is a difference in bias. So you really, 
you only subtract, you only decrease it by the bias difference. But that's, that's so the, but you get the best subtraction when you have closed spins where the bias would not change a lot. Okay, and so it actually works quite nicely. So then where do we get uh, such an intensity measurement from? So the, the, so, so the way that, uh, uh, so, so the goal is to use what, uh, an experiment called Hyrax, which is, a, uh, which is an interferometer, a radio interferometer, <coughs> and that will basically just scan the sky and look for 21 centimeter brightness. Okay, and that's because it's a, a brightness measurement, it's an intensity measurement, okay? And so that's, uh, that is the way that, that, uh, that, that astronomers want to measure uh, uh, intensity. So that's a bit like, uh, so that's, that's, if you want, it's one of the instruments that will be complementary to SKA. So for those in SKA, it's on the SKA, or will be on the SKA South Africa uh, site. Okay, but uh, I could give a complete seminar, I guess, about Hyrax as about Euclid. So let me not do that then. Okay, so what, okay, so this is going, this is going to be Hyrax H1, and the galaxy is going to be Euclid typically. And so this is the estimator again, okay? And so what are the advantages? So I already said that the density-density contamination is suppressed by the bias difference. And that's not only useful to be able to use closer rigid pairs, but when you calculate the covariance, you also suppress the covariance because in the covariance, um, you, have, you have the delta ZF, delta ZD, delta ZF, delta ZD, and when you do big, you then get delta at ZF, ZF, and delta at ZB, ZB. So even when you have widely separated redshift pairs, your variance has the, the full density signal. And that gives you big error bars in the normal case. But here you also suppress that. So this also suppresses the variance. Um, you also only have um, cross spectra. So you never have auto spectra of the same survey. And that makes it generally much more robust against systematics. Um, so one, one drawback, I should say, is that we don't have an intensity data set at this point, okay? Uh, but uh, actually the Hyrax timeline is a bit in parallel to Euclid, so it should be fine. And another drawback is that we don't, in the normal case, we would have a phi phi term that here is absent because the intensity map doesn't have, uh, doesn't have the phi. So we only always have delta phi. Okay. And so how well does it do? Uh, so here is the optimistic plot. So this is a cosmic variance limited example. Um, and so you can see that the standard, that the standard um, measurement, so this is 0.8 and 1.3, so fairly wide redshift bins, has a signal to noise of 2.4. Okay, it's also a bit unfortunate because in this case, the phi phi and the delta phi cancel partially because of their signs, okay? But uh, the Chimco one is, is much higher, okay? So it, it has actually a huge increase. That's a bit too optimistic because uh, you have to add the, the relevant noises. So the galaxy clustering has shot noise, but that's fairly small for a survey like Euclid. Um, the, radios, the radio surveys have a thermal noise and that one is actually a bit less small. And so you can see how these curves actually turn over and depending how you model it, there is at this time a fairly big uh, difference. But nonetheless, you still have, a, you still have a, a, a reasonable advantage. Okay. And, uh, and you can also see here, that's the measurement. Uh, so that's the, the, that's the measurement uncertainty. And also here, this is the standard case. And so this is the Chimco case. And you see that that intermediate redshift you do, you do fairly well. So that is how well you can measure magnification. Down here, you start to lose, and that's exactly because of the phi phi term. Okay, because out here, at, at these very high redshifts, the, the signal in the phi phi is actually bigger than the signal in the delta phi. But, but actually, a nice thing that you can do is you can actually combine these two estimators. And I'll, I'll show you an, an example after. So, but before I, I do that. So, so why do we actually want to measure these lensing potentials? Now you have seen that for the Euclid probe combination, it doesn't add so much. But that is because that's, that's basically the, the, the standard model. Um, the main reason is, okay, we want to measure lensing because lensing tells us something about, about uh, 
about gravity, about the gravitational potential. And so if you have a, if you have a, a, a dark energy fluid or a modification of general relativity, then you generically modify the link between the density and these gravitational potentials. Now, this is, this is kind of the Poisson equation, but now um, modified gravity models quite generically change this, and that can be usually modeled or often modeled with these two functions, mu and sigma, that tells you the deviations. And in modified gravity models, these can be of order one, these modifications. And, uh, and so if you can measure the, like, so the, the lensing exactly measures the sum of the two potentials, okay? So if you can extract the lensing, you can, ex you can exactly probe the sigma parameter. And in order to probe the other one, uh, you need to look how, how, how non-relativistic particles move because they are, they are accelerated by, uh, uh, by the psi potential. So light is, defect, is deflected by pi plus psi and galaxies are, are moving because of the psi. So if you look at galaxy motion, you can get this. And if you look at the lensing or magnification, mm -hmm. you can get that. And so here is an example with current data where you can nicely see how, what is, how, is, uh, how the the kind of the, the motion measurement with redshift, redshift space distortions constrains the new parameter and the lensing, well, it's slightly tilted uh, because there is also a density contribution, but they're very complementary. And you can see current errors are at the order of 0.25 and 0.05 at this point. And our, our wish is to, this, to decrease this by a significant factor, okay? We would like, after Euclid, we would like to be at the percent level in these parameters in order to really be able to characterize much better the way gravity works on large scales. That's, um, that is kind of the secret hope of the theorists in Euclid. Now, when we wrote the original proposal, there was a lot about measuring expansion rate and so on. But already then we knew that the expansion rate would be very well known by the time Euclid flies. And so what we really want to do with Euclid is measure the way gravity works. And so, so therefore that's why it's interesting, okay? And so, so how well does this Jimco estimator do? So now we get into the, prelim the world of preliminary results. I had hoped that uh, it would be done by now, but everything takes longer, okay? And so here, here I just give you the Fisher matrices because I, I just didn't have the time to do ellipses, but this here is the sigma sigma entry. And you can see that the sigma sigma entry is much better, much higher than there. And since it's the Fisher matrix, higher entry means smaller error bar. And so that's kind of good news. The bad news is that if you look at the correlation, you, you see that here you have exactly this degeneracy, okay? So you can, you can in principle measure, if you knew, if you knew, knew, you cut through here, okay? And you get the small error bar. But if you don't know the mu, you get a huge degeneracy. And if you marginalize over it, you lose all the information. And so here the standard estimator has an advantage because it has more information from the pi pi, and so it's less fat. So, so if we have no information on mu, the standard estimator is actually better. If we have good information on mu, then just, so, so using Euclid and Hyrax, so just the magnification gets us uh, of the order of uh, one and a half to 2% error. Okay. And that's, and, and this, I should just say, this is all, this is all comes for free on top of, of other measurements that, that you click on. Okay. And as I said, you can actually combine the two and then, then you really break the degeneracy quite nicely. Of course, here you have to take into account the correlations between them. And then you get, uh, then you get actually very nice like 1% measurement. Okay, and then you can do more things. So there, is, there are other, uh, other estimators people have created to constrain gravity. So as I said, you, you, for the two, for the two uh, quantity mu and sigma, you need to look at the way galaxies move and you need to look at lensing. And so, so a popular estimator is this combination of lensing and velocity uh, correlated with galaxy measurements, okay? And that measures sigma over the growth rate. So it's a bit sigma over mu, not quite, it's sigma over f, okay? And, and here, Originally, this was also built neglecting magnification. And so then there, was, uh, there were some papers, including papers by Ruth, that showed that the magnification 
if the, if the very bad contamination to this estimator and biases it significantly. And so here you can actually also use the Chimco estimator um, to exactly get rid of that because the intensity mapping doesn't have the magnification. And again, it's all, it's all in the cross, okay? Uh, so it's all cross estimators except for the except for the, the RSD measurement here. And so this is something that we think is going to be a, a, a very nice application of Jimco. But, uh, and so here is some early estimate. Uh, this is the signal to noise for SK2 Euclid photometric and Euclid spectroscopy correlated with Hyrax. And so actually I want to mostly uh, highlight this. So here we assume the 10% error on beta. And since beta multiplies your term, you can never do better than that, but you can see that you get exactly uh, a 10% measurement of sigma over, or sigma over f in this case, in several redshift spins. And if you have a better determination for mu, for spectroscopic surveys, you can indeed go to, uh, to, to uh, percent level accuracy in principle. Okay, so I'm slowly approaching the end, but there is uh, one more thing. Um, and that's, uh, you remember that in the, in the very first plot on the CMB, when I had these constraints, there were the big ellipses and then there were small ellipses. Okay, and the small ellips ellipses, it said CMB lensing. Now, I am, probably you all know what CMB, what I mean with CMB lensing. Okay, and so here is the CMB lensing power spectrum the power spectrum of the lensing potential from the CMB data. Okay, and, and the, the signal in here is about 40 sigma, while the signal in the power spectrum is only about 10 sigma. So how, how do we get this measurement? Okay, right, so far we've only worked with the power spectrum. And, and to get this measurement, uh, you use what is called a, uh, quadratic estimator. And so you, you, I'm actually amazed that this works, but it works experimentally. <laughs> so, so you say, okay, so I have a backlight here to CMB, but you can use anything, okay? And I have my large scale structure in front of the backlight. And, and so the presence of the large scale structure breaks statistical isotropy. And so normally if you have statistical isotropy and you average over over your realization, then you have only diagonal terms in your, uh, your two-point correlation function. Maybe I should, but never mind. Okay. Uh, but now if you break statistical isotropy, you have off diagonal terms. And so, so what you do is you calculate what happens if you average over your backlight, but you do not average over your foreground um, large-scale structure. Okay, and then in that case, you break your 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 your, uh, uh, your, uh, your statistical isotropy, but it sounds a bit like magic. You know, you, you average over one part of your your universe realization. You don't average about another part of your universe realization. You get something out of it, and you can use it to measure the non-average part. Okay, and so the way this effectively works is that your your quantity, for example, the CMB, okay, is the unlensed quantity, and in the case of the CMB you get the, 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 the lensing remapping, which is a convolution. So it's only second order because there is no first order lensing. Okay. And then, and because this is a convolution, when you look at, your, at an off diagonal, so at L and L prime that are not the same correlation, okay? If you had only the lens part, that would be, if you had only the unlensed part, that would be zero because, because of statistical isotropy. But now, when you calculate it with the integral, you have one x tilde that hits that x tilde, but that x tilde is in the integral. So even if I take a different L here, because I, I integrate over all the L, at some point this different L, um, this different L will actually be the same L, okay? And so you get the delta function at uh, L, L prime, if you want, or yeah, so you get the delta function when V cell and, and D cell are the same, okay? And so L prime here is then exactly L minus L. And so you get exactly the phi of L. It's really like magic, okay? 
right? So you can you can you can just check it out if you take this because this one is is uh, on length, so it's statistical isotropic. You get only the signal when this one correlated with that one is diagonal, and in that case you do get the signal, and that exactly up to an integral that 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 becomes your normalization is exactly the phi. Okay, and then it's easy to turn around. Okay, so if you want to know the phi, well, you just have to calculate this correlation. Okay. And here is the, here is an estimator where this is this, this estimated to calculate the expectation value of this. Here, so you should look at the, per, at the upper line. Okay, to calculate the, 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 the correlation here, you get exactly back your five, but you must not average over your five. <laughs> okay. And that works very well in the CMB. And, uh, and, but then, then you can actually do the same for any intensity map. Okay, and people have looked at that. But you can actually also do the same for number counts. There is nothing stopping you from applying this to galaxy number counts. And in that case, you have an additional term because number counts have a first order term. Okay? And that one is actually much bigger than the second order term. And so when you go through the procedure, and now we are in the very preliminary part of the talk. Yeah. Um, so this is the signal curve, and these are noise curves, okay? And so, so this is and so so this is for like a Euclid-like uh, case. And so, if you are in the situation where your s is 0.4, you have a very big noise, and you effectively you have no signal. So the ratio, the ratio of these uh, with the, with the weight of 12 plus one tells you your signal. But if your s is 0.9, your your noise decreases by more than an order of magnitude. So if you if you apply this to a to a galaxy survey. You have a lot less signal, and if you improve your estimator by using the linear part here, because if a general quadratic function can also have a linear part, you go even lower. And so, so I don't want to, to insist too much, but we think we can probably get uh, also of the order of thirty sigma per bin in that case uh, of signal for a galaxy survey with the quadratic estimator. But what is important is that. Applying it to galaxy surveys really decreases your noise a lot, and so we are quite uh, we are quite excited about that. But let's wait until the paper is out. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm reaching the the end slowly. So, so the points I uh, the, the take home points I'd like to make is so that all our observations, so here light, but anything else, gravitational waves, whatever, crosses our clumpy universe, and so gets this imprint from the large scale structure. So you could in principle do all of that also with gravitational waves, just be able to measure them well enough. Okay, and this okay, necessarily affects our observations. And if you neglect it, this can bias, this, this can and in general will bias your results, okay? And so you should take it into account. No, you know it's there, you should. And the CME surveys take it into account and it would be very bad if they didn't. Photometric surveys so far normally don't take it into account, but they're not yet so good. So future photometric surveys have to take it into account. Okay. Intensity mapping probably can neglect it prior to an SKA2 size thing. In higher axis, sub SNR of less than one. So of course, in some sense, you still should take it into account. Uh, so, Including it actually helps you because it gives you new information. And so we can use it to test gravity on large scales. And, and I think the other message is, why, why would you throw away free information, OK? <laughs> and uh, and uh, then the last part was, OK, it's so different ways to actually try to, to extract it. OK, uh, I think I'll stop here. Thanks a lot.